Okay, perfect. So hello everyone, welcome from the DC Sociological Society. Tonight's panel includes social activists and grassroots organization leaders that we brought together to discuss fostering collaboration with the local and national community. During this conversation, we will all create a safe, safe, respectful and organized session to learn and explore different topics that will challenge us to move beyond our comfort zones, personally and professionally, and to become more capable of maintaining an inclusive environment. So we will begin today with some guided questions for the panelists. And then in the last 30 to 40 minutes, I'll open it up to Q&A and discussion. Um, I will start by asking Jerome some questions, Nena, and then Tanaj. And I will start off with some introductions so you can know a little bit more about our panelists. So first we have Jerome Scott. Jerome is a former auto worker and labor organizer in the auto plants of Detroit in the 60s and 70s. He was a member of the League of Revolutionary Black Workers and was the founding director of Project South at the Institute for the Elimination and Poverty and Genocide in Atlanta, Georgia. He was a founding member of the National Planning Committee of the United States Social Forum and is active in social justice movements, organizations, including the League of Revolutionaries for a New America. Jerome facilitates political and popular education in diverse social movement spaces and organizations in the US South and nationally. He is a contributing author and editor of popular education toolkits and books, and is co-author of numerous chapters and articles on global capitalist crisis, race, class, gender, the revolutionary process, and transformative social movements towards socialism. Then we have Nana Amuchi. Nana is a reproductive justice attorney and a diehard black left queer feminist and abolitionist. She has worked on projects involving state and federal policy on sex education, abortion access, LGBTQI plus rights, and healthcare. Nana is an organizer with the Movement for Black Lives and is the co-chair of the Black Youth Project 100 DC chapter and an organizer with the Black Im Immigrant Network. She's also the co-organizer with DMV Mama Bailout team. Nana is also the state strategies manager for the All of the Above All team, where she works with state and local labs to advance strategies that increase abortion access to all people. Because I think it's an old bio, so I'm happy to introduce myself. Sure, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, ma'am, but I know that's, a, that's an old bio, so none of, a lot of that stuff isn't current. No problem, I apologize. When if we come when you come to the questions, I'm happy to introduce myself. So you can go to the next person. <laughs> okay, no problem. So then we have Tanaj Moody. Tanaj is a victim advocate, educator, and speaker. She's a licensed behavior specialist with a master's in criminal justice. She's the founder and CEO of Light to Life, a domestic violence awareness program that she established in 2012. Light to Life offers prevention workshops to raise awareness about domestic violence and how to build healthy relationships. Light to Life's mission is to educate, empower, and engage young adults and communities to prevent and end domestic violence. Tanaj has worked in settings such as residential facilities with at-risk youth, in correctional facilities, mental health facilities, nonprofits, special education schools, high schools, and colleges. She's dedicated her career to human services and victim advocacy. Thank you for joining us tonight, Tanaj. So then I'll start with some questions where I just wanna ask a bit more about the organizations that you're involved with. So I'll let you speak about those. So I'll start with Jerome. So uh, Jerome, we spoke a little bit earlier about your involvement with the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit in the 60s and 70s. And as I was kind of reading about the organizations you were involved with, um, you're currently involved with the League of Revolutionaries for a New America, which actually merged with the League of Revolutionary Black Workers in the 70s. So I just wanted to hear a bit about what it was like to be a part of this kind of ever growing and evolving organization and about maybe what has contributed to its success in reaching and educating so many. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Um, I think in order to understand uh, the merger, I think we have to realize that the 60s and early 70s was a period of time where we had a high level of activity in the country. You know, high level, the mo movements were developing, workers' movements, women's movements, you know, movement around the elimination of white supremacy, you know, civil rights movement. Everything was anti-war movement, all was on a very 
high level. And, and not only that, you know, we, we as a group really thought that um, the possibility of actually winning was in sight, you know? And so we were a very excited and enthusiastic grouping of people. So when we got the opportunity, well, the only reason that we were looking around the country was that the, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers had, went, had, had a split you know, between the, uh, what, what became the Black Workers Congress and us who were left in the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. And, you know, and so we were sort of looking around to see what was going on. And we was also in the middle of our very first political education retreat at that time. You know, and, and we studied everything. We studied Mao, we studied Nkrumah, we studied all the African scholars and all of the Marxist scholars. And um, it was at that point that we began to realize that Marxism for us was the science and the theory that really spoke to the work that we were doing as workers in the auto plant more than any other worldview did. And so it was a very, very exciting moment to meet up with an organization that was a Marxist organization, you know, the, it, at that time, it was the um, communist, the California Communist League. And once we merged in, in the early 70s, uh, we all became the Communist Labor Party, you know, which was a national organization. So it was a very, very exciting time and a very, very um, instructive time. I mean, we, we were for the first, well, I should speak for myself. It was about maybe 70 people that went through this 18 month retreat, education retreat. And it was really for the first time that I had ever did any kind of study of Marxism or study of any kind of liberation movements or any of that. So it was a very, very enlightening time for me and a very formative moment for me. That's incredible. Thanks for sharing. Um, and then Nana, I don't. Did you want to do your introduction first? Yeah. Um, or I can talk about my organizing work. Um, so I am trained as a lawyer, um, uh, but have mostly been in the policy realm and also uh, helping to build infrastructure, you know, movement infrastructure and also support organizing and movements with lawyering. Um, but I. For the last uh, few years, I had organized with an organization called Black Youth Project 100 and really like cam campaigns around decriminalizing sex work. Um, uh, you know, no new, no new jail, stopping the construction of jails and around abolition broadly. Um, I identify with, you know, Black revolutionary concepts, whether that's Black revolutionary communisms or anarchisms or socialisms and support whatever's gonna get Black people free. Um, currently, I am uh, really appreciate being in the space with Jerome Scott because obviously I'm like reading about <laughs> a, re a revolutionary league of workers in Detroit and, and Detroit and I watched last night a couple documentaries with a friend on Alice Coltrane and we're just talking about Detroit's really uh, rich revolutionary history and um, artistry so appreciate that. Um, but currently I'm, I'm organizing in a, in, a, in a number of different spaces so one of those spaces is uh, the Black Alliance for Peace. On, I'm in the DC hub and uh, the Black Alliance for Peace is an anti-imperialist, anti-war Black organization um, that organization organizes under the banner of um, Pan-Africanism among, uh, sorry, <laughs> get distracted when people are in the room. Um, okay, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, and so I uh, have recently organized some 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 rallies um, in solidarity with uh, folks on the ground in Haiti who are fighting against U.S. imperialism and, and, and the U.S. exploitation and really focus in on, uh, on Africa and the Caribbean and Latin America and just U.S. militarism. Um, I, my folks are originally from Nigeria, and so I am first generation Nigerian, grew up in uh, California and went to school and law school out there and have been in DC for about uh, almost five years now. 
also support work at the Great Panthers in DC. Um, you know, just co-chairing the uh, the group to support some of my elders, Rick and Michelle Tingling Clemens, um, who are also some Black communists who I uh, support and love deeply. And yeah, have been organizing in the DC mutual aid, Easter River mutual aid. And so we've been doing direct drop-offs for um, over 10,000 Black families. And um, I'm really big on political education, really big on doing a lot of mediation and transformative justice work. Um, and conflict, you know, mediation. And so um, I'm in a lot of different spaces and really excited to um, be in this space and share whatever I have to offer and also learn from folks in this space. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then, so Tanaj, you are, we mentioned this a little bit earlier, but CEO and founder of Light to Life, which educates young people about mental health, trauma and healthy relationships. Um, I know this was partly uh, inspired by personal experiences, but can you tell me more about how your organization educates the community? And then also I would love to hear about what it was like going through the process of founding your own organization. And if you have any tips or insight for young people who would be interested in doing something similar. Yes, 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 yes. Um, what a layered question. Thank you. Uh, and thanks for having me. I'm honored to be here on the panel and, and to connect with folks on the panel today and just to share information. So I'm very grateful about that. Um, and so just to answer, you know, your first question about, I guess, like really how Light to Life was inspired and, and how it came about. And myself, uh, I'll start with by saying that I'm an empowered survivor. And so Light to Life's birth uh, came from my own lived experiences. Um, at the age of 16, I fell victim to domestic violence. And I think what's one thing that people don't talk about often is what are the contributing factors that lead to a person's victimization? Um, and I was raised in North Philly uh, by a single mother who was incarcerated over 18 times during my childhood due to her own victimization. Um, and because of that, it has um, been a part of what has given me passion, what has given me drive, and what has given me motivation to do everything that I do uh, in my life daily. And Light to Life was founded in 2014 at Wesley College. Wesley College is in Dover, Delaware. And you know, I don't, I think what's important is like the journey along, there's so much that happened between that time of me falling victim to domestic violence at the age of 16 to being able to actually being able to speak about my victimization and share my story with folks to be able to help and heal and educate other people. So that was a long journey in itself. Um, it definitely wasn't something that happened overnight. And when I went into school 2014 uh, to pursue my bachelor's, I was still experiencing a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress um, from the experience of the abuse. And, you know, growing up in a low poverty area where there's not a lot of educational resources, as well as role models to really educate you on like what a healthy relationship is, and how it's supposed to feel um, is what has been the purpose of Light to Life. And so when I was in school and still experiencing all of these different symptoms of suicidal ideation, I had a low self-esteem, I had a low confidence, I was doing very poor, um, just trying to focus and pay attention. And, you know, at the same time, still being able to, you know, make the Dean's List and all these different things, which I think are, are accomplishments that are rare because of what I was experiencing, no one knew, um, where I wasn't able to sleep or eat or anything. And it came to a point where my nightmares got so bad and even the lightest sound or someone touching me, giving me a hug or anything like that would be a trigger for me. And it just became so overwhelming in my life where I needed to seek help. And I started actually going to a counselor on the campus at the school. And from that experience, it 
made me realize that there's power in my story, that there's strength in what I experience and that I need to find that. And I need to rediscover that strength and I'm resilient because of that. And so in 2014, I was like realizing that I know I'm not the only person that has experienced this. Um, and especially on a college campus. And so from that point on, it was pivotal where I said, I'm gonna start a program where young people can talk about their story because what was so powerful in me being able to heal was me being able to break my silence. I was silent for three years where no one knew what I was experiencing and I would cover my face with makeup and I would make excuses to my mom blaming marks and bruises on sports. And for three years, I was silent. And I was able to find power in being able to break that silence. And I've been able to, you know, develop this program on a college campus. And it was the first domestic violence organization on Wesley College campus. And from there, it was just like, me following God's path and me being able to impact over 1500 college students from expanding from Wesley College in Delaware to Delaware State University. And then in 2017, I was able to establish Light to Life as an LLC prevention consulting program. And I've been able to, you know, partner with Temple University, Howard University, been able to partner with the Dep Department of Corrections and juvenile facilities. And I've just been so blessed to be able to have this impact and being able to be in spaces and create these sacred spaces for people to feel seen and heard and understood. And there's so much power in that. And um, Light to Life has really been the light to my life. It's been able to provide me with not just healing, but being able to help other folks through healing. And with that, um, Light to Life does it through um, education. And so with education, a lot of the curriculum that I created is around how to identify warning signs of an abusive relationship. Because these are things that I didn't know about. Everything that I've created and everything that I teach are things that I wish I would have known when I was 16. And so I work with young people, teach them how to identify the warning signs of an unhealthy relationship, an abusive relationship. And also how do you develop healthy relationship skills, which is also so important. And then in addition to that, how do you develop healthy communication skills as well as self-care versus self-trust? Because a big piece of domestic violence what people don't often talk about is what it does to someone's self-esteem, what it does to someone's confidence. And that's a big part of what I work on. Um, and I do this through a lot of different partnerships with different nonprofit organizations, um, as well as webinars, virtual um, digital courses, um, and in-person trainings uh, with, as I was mentioning before, like the Department of Corrections, different government agencies, colleges and universities. Uh, and so really being able to not only educate young people on what domestic violence is, but really how to build healthy relationships and how to build their self-esteem and then also work with professionals and staff and teachers on how they're able to identify when a student of theirs is experiencing an abusive relationship or how can they communicate and work with that student. So I do a lot of those different things in terms of advocacy and education. But overall, uh, Light to Life has been, uh, overall mission is just educating and empowering and engaging communities. And so a big piece of that has come through uh, a lot of the co collaborations that I've been able to have. That's really incredible. And then, sorry, just to follow up, but do you have any advice for young people who or anybody who want to start their own organizations yeah definitely uh and i would i would definitely say um if a student is interested in starting your organization or starting any kind of organization it has to come from a place 
that you're passionate about. Um, or it has to come from something that you you'll have fun with because, you know, anyone can start an organization. Like I'm not, I'm not like any special person. Anyone can do start an organization and being able to create these spaces for folks. But what I will say is that it takes, you know, it takes passion, it takes drive, it takes patience, it takes flexibility and understanding and compassion and grace. And so for any advice is that I would say is if you have an idea and you have an idea that you know is going to have a positive impact on your peers or in your community. And even if it's something that's been done before and you're tweaking it to be a little bit different, then just do it um, because you really never know what people are experiencing and you really never know how your idea may help someone else. And so I would say is like, don't feed into your fear and don't feed into your doubt and to really fight for it and, and go for it. That's amazing advice, thank you. Um, speaking of passion, Jerome, I wanted to ask you to, first of all, tell me a little bit about what politicized you and then also what has just kept your flame lit and your passion and your drive going throughout the years. Yes, that's a, that's a familiar question. Um, for your first question, you know, it's, it's like one, I, I read the questions that you sent out and it's like, what was my aha moment? You know, what? What made me get into this? And, um, but before I get into that, I want to say one thing about starting a new organization, because I, th I think um, what you just said was very critical. I just wanted to add one point to it. And that is that when we started Project Sound, the one thing that we did that I, I hang on to to this day is that we established a group of people that wanted to do it so that we had a crew, you know, so that whenever one of us were down and out, the rest of us could pick each other up. So I would just add that if you are interested in starting an organization, have all the enthusiasm and drive and all that, that's really critical, but take the time to develop a crew that will help you push this thing through. Um, <clears throat> I'll try to make this short, you know, because my my political story is very long. I'm I'm I've been around a little while, but my initial aha moment um, came to me while I was in Vietnam. I was a soldier in the Vietnam War. <clears throat> and there were there were several times in which um, you know, I began to think about why I was there, but the most important moment was um, we had this detail, which every soldier in our unit had to do, which was go down to the river and get water for the site. Every day, a different team of people would do it. So uh, one day, we our team went down to get some water, and we saw all these leaflets laying on the ground next to the water hole. And one of the leaflets said, Black soldier. Why are you in the front of the line in Vietnam and at the back of the line at home? And that was all it said. And, you know, all of the black soldiers who, who looked at that leaflet, you know, we couldn't stop talking when we got back to our tent. You know, we could not stop talking. How do they even know this? <laughs> but it made us realize that something was going on because in Vietnam, um, the position that was called the point, the guy who led the platoon wherever they were going, you know, you had a guy about 20 yards ahead, ahead of the rest of them, rest of us, that was called the point. And points were like 70% of all points in Vietnam were black. And the life expectancy of a point was like 30%, maybe 30% of the people who were points would make it out of there alive or without a wound, without being seriously wounded. You know, so the flyer saying, why are you at the front of the line in Vietnam just really blew us away. So that was like my first sort of inkling of, I should not just be in Vietnam without some understanding of what was going on and why was this 
Vietnamese telling me about what, what, what my circumstances are and not me telling myself about what my circumstances are. So not only did that set me on a journey, but it also, the thing that it really did to me was it made me begin to think, rethink everything that I'd ever learned. You know, like what was patriotism? I thought patriotism was going off to Vietnam. What that flyer sort of made me think about is, is that really patriotism if I don't even know why I'm here? And if I'm automatically gonna get the most dangerous job, you know, in a dangerous place, in a very dangerous place, you get the most dangerous job, you know? And, and so it was those sort of thoughts that continued. And what I really concluded by the time I was done in Vietnam, I concluded that I would never ever go any place again in my life where I didn't understand why I was there. And I could, and if anybody asked me, what are you doing here? I would be able to explain to them what my motivations were. Someone asked me why I was in Vietnam. I couldn't explain it. It was like they sent me here, you know, and, and therefore I'm here. But um, that was the thing that really got my political spirit flowing. You know, and so when I got back home um, to Detroit and ended up in the plant, in the auto plant, you know, the first thing I did was to ask my supervisor to give me a copy of the contract because I want to know what my duties are. I want to know what I'm supposed to be doing and I want to know what I don't supposed to do so that when you tell me something that I know I'm not supposed to do, I can show you the contract and said, no, I'm not doing that. So that was my inspiration. And the second part of your question was? How have you kept your passion alive through the years since oh, then? Oh, that's, that's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the only way that you can really sustain the, up, the ebbs and flows, <clears throat> the ups and downs of the movement is you have a, a clear understanding of what your worldview is and a clear understanding of why you're involved. You know, what, why are you here? Why are you a communist? Why are you a revolutionary? Why are you a, a visionary? You know, and if you don't have a clear understanding, and the thing that gave me a clear understanding of that was my study of theory. You know, the, the fact that we were introduced to Marxism gave us an understanding of not only how the world works, <clears throat> but also how the movement develops, you know, and how there, there is going to be ebbs and flows in every movement. And the thing that keeps you going is, to, if, is for you to be able to see the ebb coming and know that if you keep doing the kind of things that you're doing, you will be able to not only make it to the next upsurge in the movement, but you'll be able to learn a lot of stuff during that low period, you know, a period of real time for study, a time for discussion, a time for really working out the, the kinks and your work patterns and all that, you'll be able to come to the next upsurge in a much better position to be able to serve in that upsurge, you know? And so it's theory, it's theory. If you if you want to survive 40, 50 years of struggle, then you have to have a worldview that, that tells you that during the hard times, better times are going to come. And eventually you'll get to the point where you've developed enough strength, you know, by, by organizing and, and educating, politically educating yourselves and everyone around you, where you can actually make a difference in how the world works. You know, but theory is the key and constant political education. Absolutely. Thank you. And then, um, Nana, similarly, I was curious about what radicalized you and how you center those beliefs um, in social justice in your everyday life. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, I was um, from a young age, I've always had, I'm the youngest of four. And I always was questioning why things have to be what why they are, but you know, um, and yeah, just pushing back. Like for instance, I had you know created a petition in 
in third grade to petition for like a girl sports team. Um, in middle school, I had petitioned to be on the boys football team. So it was like very much, you know, first wave or whatever, second wave feminism of like, why can't, you know, what I, whatever I want to do, I can do, you know, pushing back against, you know, a patriarchy in the church, you know, and becoming the altar server and those things. And then I had always been involved on like student student activism. So was in leadership and president of the, you know, black student union in high school and college. And I was president of the black law students association and in law school, but, you know, was involved in, in college, but still had a very much racial justice perspective. You know, like I know things are, are not great for black folks. And so we need to figure out how to retain and recruit students and like, increase campus safety, you know, and still having understanding of black folks, but not necessarily the systematic, economic, political, capitalist, white supremacist system. And so it's really um, at the end of college, you know, I went to law school with, with this idea that, you know, want to be the change you wish to see. And um, I, I got to college in uh, August of, of 2012. And so that was around the Zimmerman verdict. So at that time I started, I had traveled a little bit before and I had started to you know, read more about like black feminisms and read more about colonialism in Nigeria and read more about, uh, you know, colonialism and like, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 revolutionaries in Africa and in the Caribbean. Um, and then, you know, in my first semester of law school was sitting in a lot of deep contradictions because in the, if you know, in the Zimmerman verdict um, and also um, during Ferguson, a lot of everything was surrounded around law it was like, oh, what's the what's the legal thing around this, you know? And so people were debating the law and I'm in law school, like we are literally learning some really racist white supremacist things and not talking about it in the classroom. And so I, I, I really hated the law school and I felt in deep contradictions and I came out of law school very much like, you know, my world, my thought of how change happens is one of organizing and one of people make changes, not you know, we can leverage these different tactics, you know, whether it's the law or all these things, but at the end of the day, it's going to take people and, you know, having more clarity around, you know, the type of violence that we're living in. And so, um, so yeah, I, I, I had gone to a, a, a conference, Congressional Black, Black Conference in 2016, and there were some BYP 100 folks on the panel who were talking about abolition. And so I was like drawn to that around like people who were unapologetically, you know, for the abolition of police and for the abolition of capitalism. And so in these last four years, I have consistently gotten more uh, politicized, you know, and, and strengthened my understanding of like Pan-Africanism and strengthened my understanding of anti-imperialism and really feel like that is like a, 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 a perspective that needs to, and, and a politic and, and an ideology that needs to be taken during this time, you know, and I think last summer, with COVID and, you know, the uprising to really consistently, it, it further expose, you know, the contradictions of these systems that we're living in and that it's a year later um, and the government still has not on every level, on most levels of government in DC, where we have a black mayor, we have a black head of department of health, we have all these, you know, black folks in high spaces, but at the end of the day, people are dying and, and more and more people have been incarcerated in DC during this COVID-19. And so, you know, understanding that we have to propose a different type of future. And so, I don't know, I have a lot of, I'm in a lot of different spaces. I have a lot of friends that I, and comrades that I struggle with. And so, um, you know, yeah, my politicization is really just a journey of being a black person in this world and also having that internationalist perspective and also understanding and believing in black people's self-determination and black people's autonomy and that, you know, if we should have control over the food that we eat, control over the education that we have. And in order to do that, we actually have to do those things and not wait on the state. And so that's also what politicized me around black anarchism, which is really like returning back to African communal communalism and African ideologies that are really rooted in the community and in collectivism. Thank you. And then I just also just curious. So you mentioned just, you know, white supremacy and views ingrained in law school and as it is in education in general. So what is the responsibility do you think of academics and people who are in these educational spaces of, you know, being aware of what we're reading and um, just asking those hard questions all the time and kind of the importance of that? Yeah, yeah, you know, um, I was listening to Dr. Joy James uh, some weeks ago and she was just talking about how, you know, just living within this country 
in the U.S., we kind of already, you're born kind of how you're born. You're, you're kind of born into these conditions and we're already sitting in contradictions and we kind of all are complicit on some level of something. And so um, the importance of waging, you know, a battle or war wherever you're at. And so I think the job of academics is to the extent that you can move resources to communities to the extent that you're actually, you know, I, I, I listen to this podcast of, you know, folks who are studying political economy, like what, are, where is it the development and the study of things that are actually confronting the, the state? You know, I think, <laughs> I think, I think we need more, well, what are the ways you can open up more space um, and more uh, capacity and more resources for people to for communities to organize themselves? Um, how can you also be organized into something right? I think that's the, part of the issue is like this individualism um, or the celebrity activism where you have individuals who are speaking on behalf or individual academics, but you're not connected to any formation or any coalition or any organization. So you're doing behalf on, on of, but you're not struggling with anyone. So there, there's no actual built in accountability. And so what does it mean to, you know, either start forming, you know, like I, I know just thinking about COVID-19, right? Like how are, or how are scientists and people who are physicists and all these folks organizing um, to actually provide people alternatives around the information that is coming out of COVID, right? So if the CDC is saying that there's, you know, it, they've moved from six feet to three feet, what is the organized response for people who are studying the science, who understand vaccines, who understand a virus, who understand also the political and economic and social uh, structures, not in that they are, you know, yeah. So I, I just think the extent that folks can study, but I mean, I don't, I don't have all the answers. Um, I just know that uh, wherever we find ourselves, we should be pushing, pushing, pushing the, pushing up against the status quo and pushing against these institutions and also recognizing when something needs to fizzle out because I think you know some you know black studies has had its ebbs and flows right black studies that started out as this like revolutionary project and then quickly gets co-opted by the state or at the and also being real like if I'm in going you know when I talk to people about law school it's like let's be real about the institution <laughs> You know, so be really clear about what institution you're going into and why you're going into this institution and what is the built in accountability for when you make decisions and when you do this work. Um, but, you know, I think I think we all have skills and and I'm trying to figure I'm trying to continuously figure figure that out. Um, but I think the extent to which you can you, you can share resources, uh, make things free, you know, like I think any academic should be making everything free like what what you know why why are we paying for journals why are we paying to read things that people need in order to understand you know where they're at so so how are you pushing up against these things and also like even on campus or in these institutions organizing yourselves so like Jerome talked about you know the the um the the plant in Detroit right so workers also you know supporting worker workers organizing and and also connecting your worker fight to other worker fights and internationally and here um, so I think there's lots of things that folks can do once we kind of get clear about what the academia is and how it is a, a state, app, you know, it is a, a state apparatus, right? The state uses the education system to uh, uh, control us, to depoliticize us and to um, not make us disconnect from communities. So how can you at every step be pushing it up against that if you know that's what it's for? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, so Tanaj, speaking of just pushing back, um, what have you, so just like pushing back and, and creating change, what have you found to be critical in executing behavioral or social change within the community in your line of work? Can you repeat that in another way for me, please? <laughs> yeah, so just like some tactics that you've noticed or patterns or anything where or just strategies that you use that you have found to be, I guess, most effective um, and that most communicable to people and that people accept, um, but also just any important lessons that you've learned over the years. Thank you. So kind of alluding to what I was talking about earlier was about collaboration. Um, and I know Nena and Jerome, we, they've also been mentioning this in terms of just like organizing. Right, and so in regards to collaboration, that has been one of the strategies and tactics that I've used in being able to provide resources, education and tools for young people. 
And so me being able to reach out to, uh, and I'll give a recent example. Um, I reached out literally in a direct message on Instagram to an organization that is doing work on college campuses uh, around um, sexual violence and raising awareness on that, on their campus. And so the organization is under Civic Nation, uh, which is an umbrella for It's On Us, which is under um, Joe Biden's administration, as well as um, End Rape on Campus. And so I reached out to this organization through a direct message and they reached back out to me and said that, you know, we should work together. And the reason that that is so important is because if you have large platforms that you're working with on college campuses or in the community um, or just in general, it's important to make those collaborations because you have a larger impact on what you're doing, right? I'm only one person and I can't do everything. And it's so important to be able to have a team effort amongst other things that I may not be an expert in, right? And to be able to share these different perspectives and insights and information and resources has been one of the tools that has been very successful in me being able to have such a large impact on this area in terms of domestic violence prevention. It's been being able to collaborate with these different programs, these different people, um, and being able to provide these resources that are accessible for, for young people. So collaboration has been pivotal and one of the main strategies. And in addition to that, one of the things that I do um, often specifically uh, is like host different ways to get the community involved. And so part of Light to Life's mission is to engage communities to prevent domestic violence. And so by engaging, there's different things that I do around social media, different campaigns, as well as a, a podcast where people can share their story. Humble plug, I have a podcast called The State of Blossoming on Apple and Spotify. <laughs> and so, you know, specifically for Women's History Month, uh, this month, I am doing a video campaign where I'm highlighting the everyday women. And what that means is everyday women who are in our communities who maybe do not have a large platform, but are doing important work that deserve to be recognized. So it's everyday women that you should know. Everyday women could be moms, teachers, doctors, nurses, professors, everyday women that deserve the recognition that are often overlooked and really are not highlighted. And so doing different things like that in order to engage the community in, in other ways is really important because not only do you give opportunities for you to be able to share your information resources, but you also create a space where people can connect and, and can share with each other. Um, and so you're really building like this community um, around your organization. And, you know, the other thing is when I was talking about the podcast, the podcast has been such a great tool for me to be able to create a space for people all around the world where I've been able to have an opportunity for them to be able to share their empowered survivor stories or share their different resources or things that they're doing in their community that could be helpful for other folks. I've been able to connect with people, you know, which I don't even know how they got my contact information. It's just like, God just works. It's just, I'm just like very grateful. Like I've been able to connect with people in like Hawaii, a woman in Hawaii who talked about her leaving the corporate world and being able to create this community and start her own business as a wellness coach and being able to create this space virtually for all women around the world where people are doing meditation and yoga and food plans, you know, being able to connect with things like that are so important um, and being able to share those stories for people to be able to hear are very important. And, you know, I then was able to connect with another woman um, in London uh, who was Pakistan and she experienced an abusive marriage at the age of 16. So she really talked about the different 
cultural and religious barriers that play into domestic violence. And so overall, you know, being able to create these different ways to engage folks, for them to be able to share their resources, their information, their stories has been very pivotal in terms of me being able to educate and connect with people. In addition to that is like the collaboration and being able to like just reach out to folks, you know, like a cold call or a cold email, you know, those kinds of things go a really long way. Not everything has to be this formal long process. Like what happened to picking up the phone and just calling people, you know, and just shooting your shot and it might work. And if it doesn't, at least you tried. And so that has been pivotal. So collaborating with other organizations and in addition to that, being able to create um, different ways for people to get involved in what you're doing and for them to be able to share what they're doing and their stories and their resources and their tools has been so important for the work that I'm doing. Thank you. So on top of collaboration being absolutely crucial, Jerome, I also know that creating short-term and long-term goals is essential. So do you have any advice about how we can balance or create goals that are realistic, but also revolutionary, progressive, and impactful? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> um, you know, take, for example, the two major issues that we've been talking about tonight. Um, white supremacy, you know, and black liberation and domestic violence and the liberation of women. I think that the, the short term goal, of course, within those two issues, you know, is to figure out a way where we can get organized, where we can make sure that we're able to collectively continue to advance, even though these problems still exist, but we can figure out a way to mitigate the problem, to make it not as horrible as it, as it is, and to educate ourselves about how to move forward and, and get out of the situations that we might be in. <clears throat> but the other side of it is, um, I think we also have to do, do the long-term work of uh, looking at how our society is organized, you know, how this capitalist society is organized and what effect that have on the struggles that we're fighting. You know, when you look at white supremacy and it's pretty clear that, you know, capitalism is really the source of white supremacy. You know, it's the, um, when we talk about white supremacy being institutionalized, what we really mean is that capitalism has set it up so that in every institution, every organization that it has established, is, is riddled and, and completely organized in such a way that black folks will be limited in terms of their opportunity. And depending on the institution, if it's the state, the police, you know, you have to worry about your life every time you encounter the state apparatus, you know? And so it pet perpetuates white supremacy in every turn. What that says to me is that not only do you have to have these short-term goals of trying to eliminate it and making sure that we can get through it, but we also have the long-term goal of how do we eliminate it? How do we ensure that the next generation does not have to go through the exact same struggles that we're going through now? And the same thing can be said about domestic violence. I mean, the patriarchal has been a very constant thing in the development of this capitalist society. I mean, the whole notion that women are inferior to men is commonplace. I mean, it is the root cause of domestic violence. And, and so when I look at both of these questions, I have to ask the same thing. Can we rid ourselves in the long run of patriarchal and white supremacy while we maintain capitalism? which is the root of both of those things. And so th what that says to me is not only do you have to have short-term goals, but you have to figure out how do your short-term goals connect with your long-term strategy 
to eliminate the source of your problem, which means we have to figure out a way to eliminate capitalism. So that's my takeaway from years of struggle and years of trying to get to the bottom of all these problems. They all lead back to capitalism. And so we have to figure out a better way to organize our society, a more cooperative way of organizing our society and a society that doesn't tolerate, you know, as a matter of fact, makes it totally illegal for white supremacist errors to continue to happen and for male supremacist errors to continue to happen. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. That's um, what I've been learning as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and then my last question for Nana before we open up to Q&A. Um, Nana, I was curious, just, you know, hypothetically, when you envision a ideal future society or community, what is it that you see or what are some of the main components of that? And then what might be some of the steps that we would have to take as a community to achieve that? Um, um, is that question for me or the next That was for Nana. Okay. So if you wanna chime in. Um, I mean, when I'm thinking of, of, about community, I'm specifically thinking about Black folks. I'm specifically thinking about African folks globally and here in the U.S. And so I think of African folks having land, access to land, land that, uh, you know, like I said, the autonomy, I think when I think of it, I think of uh, community autonomy and Black autonomy over what we eat, how we live, how we form relationships, how we form communities. Um, free from violence, both on a state level and on, on a communal level, um, the ability to pursue and cultivate um, and foster your interests and your desires and pleasure and joy, um, the ability to f have time, have the time and resources and the capacity to, to foster deep loving relationships with ourselves, with um, each other and with the land around us. Um, and that the steps to that, I don't have a, I don't have a step-by-step -step plan, but I, like Jerome said, it actually requires the, the, the destruction of, you know, this, 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 this project that the United States would, you know, which is based off of capitalism and imperialism. So we have to, um, yeah, have to fight against these economic, economic systems. And, and, and I don't have that, again, I don't have the answers, uh, but I do know that there have been successful things that have happened that I can learn from the past. Um, and so encouraging folks to get in, you know, doesn't have to be a formal organization. It can be, you know, organized project. It can be a community project. It can be a, co a coalition um, or it can be an organization um, that is actually developing. You know, I was just really uh, taken back because, you know, on, on the social media, it's just like always so many conversations. And, you know, there's a conversation about political education and whether that's important. And I think that's like a result of this this West, the West that, that we're living in that makes it seem like we're not, we're not worthy of understanding history. We're not worthy of learning what people have done. We're not learning, worthy of like learning the type of world we live in and what it's going to take. And so, yeah, when, when Jerome said that folks did an 18 month political education, I'm, I'm thinking that's the type of rigor and discipline. It's like, how do we actually make time to learn and understand what we're doing, understanding that we are also being organized somewhere else. Like, me going through law school and the pathway I took, <laughs> there were some also forces that were getting me, you know, pushing me to a different route than the route that I took. And so that is through political education and that's through relationships. So um, yeah, I mean, just this past Sunday, just got a group of friends and neighbors together to do a black autonomy community pop-up where we gave out a hundred uh, Sada Shakur books for free. Uh, I cooked over 150, you know, jerk chicken bowls. Um, we gave out hygiene products. People got, did vaccine registration, gave out food, clothes, and like, how do you do that on a consistent basis and like really start to have conversations and, 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 and figure out like how people can have housing and how people can eat, you know? So those are things that I'm interested in and invested in because I think we have to actually practice the things we want in order to realize it. Absolutely, super inspiring. Thank you so much. Um, but yeah, we can pass it off to Q&A. If anyone has any questions, you can type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. So, so we have um, a couple questions. Um, <clears throat> 
So first is for Ms. Moody. Um, the question is, any statistics on her outreach efforts? How many people has her organization touched or reached? Thank you. Um, and so <laughs> a lot, <laughs> but I will say um, it's definitely over now. Um, it started at Wesley. Wesley's college is a private institution. There's about I'd say about maybe 1200 students there in total. Um, and I consistently had this program running at the college for three years. Um, and so definitely I would say over about 1500 um, young people because that not only includes universities and colleges but it also includes the DOC because I've worked in juvenile facilities as well. Um, and in addition to that, um, I've partnered with like local black owned businesses specifically, um, one is in the village cafe, um, and we've hosted self-defense classes and things like that within the community. Um, so yeah, I would say well over, well over 1500. Thank you. Um, another question is, and this could be, um, I think it's, it could be for anyone. And so it is, um, what do you say to those that say, I can't be an activist, I can't speak out, um, you know, I'm not like that, I'm not going to be on the streets. Um, this is a very common question, um, especially for students, like college students, like I'm not the type of person to be out there protesting and doing that kind of stuff, or speaking out about traumas or all these type of things. So what do you say to that person, right? That's saying that they can't do this or that's not who they are. And so what would you say to these people? And if we wanna go, we can go Jerome and go in the order that we had previously. Okay. Um, I'm a strong believer in a division of labor. You know, everybody don't have to be in the street. And every and every the definition of activist doesn't have to be that you're in the street. You know, you can be an act you can be an activist who's a lawyer, and you're in Detroit in the League of Revolutionary Black Workers. We had a whole branch of lawyers. They didn't go to the street. They prepared the cases. They made sure that when we went to jail, we got out. You know, and we we had a whole cadre of students. They did work in the in uh, the, their classroom in the schools. You know, I think the most important thing is that if 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 you want if you have the the view that you want to advance our people and advance our society, and you want to figure out how you can best do it, well, let's figure out what you do best and see how that connects, and see how we can use your skills to advance the whole objective process, the whole movement that we're involved in, and, and you do what you do. If we can figure that, now there'll be a bunch of folks that we can't figure that out with. Well, okay, maybe later we can figure it out when the movement is further advanced. But that to me is the way to do it. You shouldn't try to force people to do the things that they're not prepared to do. What we should do is try to get, try to figure out what it will take to prepare them to make their contribution in the way that they can best make it. Do either other two panelists wanna um, respond to that? <laughs> can you repeat the question again, please? What do you say to the people that say, I can't be an activist, I'm not the person being out on the streets? Um, and you know, they can't speak about their traumas or things going on and that's just not who they are. Like, what do you say to those people who are resistant to being advocates or activists? I think, um one of the things that I appreciated what Jerome mentioned is like really redefining what activism means to you. 
right? And it doesn't always have to look like you are on the streets and protesting and those kinds of things. Like everyone has their unique ways of act, like of activism. And so for some folks, activism can look simply as donating to an organization that supports um, what their values are, what their morals are, right? Activism can look like what Nena was mentioning about, you know, being able to have a, a, a community drive of uh, getting people signed up for their vaccines and food and things like that. Like that is another example of activism. Activism could look something like doing a social media campaign and talking about different issues and topics that are not being um, discussed, right? So I really think it just depends on the person and it depends on like you being able to define what that looks like for you. And I will say just from like a, from my perspective, cause I don't want to um, say all survivors cause like survivors are not a monolith. Like everyone has like their own individual experience. So from my own individual experience and just speaking on that, um, one thing that I will say that's important is that, you know, don't feel pressured to share your story all the time, right? That's, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily have to be the only way that you can help people. Something as simple as sharing a domestic violence hotline number is another great way of showing activism, right? or sharing local shelter homes, right? Or donating hygiene products to correctional facilities for women, right? So there's there's so many different ways of how it can look and it doesn't necessarily, in terms of my experience, doesn't always have to look like you sharing your story because sharing your story is so valuable, but it has a lot of, you're, you're almost reliving that over and over again every time you share it. And I don't even think a lot of people consider that when folks are like, can you come share your story? And then another thing is they don't value that. And folks expect people to share their experiences, whether it was incarceration or domestic violence or whatever it was, and then not being able to put value into that. And I think, you know, that's, that's so important. Um, it's just overall, it's gonna look different for everybody. And it really just depends on the person and how they define it and, and what is comfortable for them. Yeah, just uplifting what both folks said. I think, you know, everyone has their, everyone has a talent, everyone has a role, everyone has something to offer. Um, and I think it should, you should find ways to do it in collaboration and in, in, in a community with other people um, because that's where we have most impact. But I agree with what both so folks said and also want to uplift the storytelling of, yeah, like also how do we provide resources to folks who are, who are sharing, sharing stories and, um, you know, not everyone needs to be out speaking. Um, yeah, everyone has a role. Okay, our next question, um, how do we develop deeper relations and unity with the community and the revolutionary struggle in society and our classroom and campuses, right? So how we give these, you know, deeper and more meaningful connections between the community and the campus? Um, and so how do we develop those and make them, you know, richer? And so we can just keep going in the same order. <laughs> so there's no confusion. So Jerome, if you want to go first. Well, to me, the most important thing is to do work together. I mean, you know, we all have, every community has struggles. Every school, every college, every university has struggles particularly for the students or the residents of a community or the workers at a workplace. We all have struggles. And sometimes those, those struggles are connected and sometimes they're not. But the way you build deeper unity is by building deeper relationships through struggle, through supporting one another. You know, through, you know if, if I'm working in a plant and my community is struggling with um, police brutality, 
And in the plant, I'm struggling with the abuse of the foreman. That's a connection. That's a connection that, that we should be talking. You know, when I go home, I want to talk to my community about what's going on at work. And I want to hear what they got to say about what's going on in the community so that we can figure out a way of how to support one another. You know, and, and that will un unfold in different ways. You know, and the community might just be able to say, I got a place in the community where y'all can meet. That's good. Or the person in, in the factory might say, well, look, you know, uh, we put out regular flyers at the plant and we have a machine that we develop our flyers on. Why don't y'all uh, in the community just come over and you can develop some flyers around the struggle that's going on there. And we can talk about how we're connected now and how we're supporting each other. But the point is that the way you develop deep relationships is by working together and struggling together. And, and the last thing I, I would say about that is, we also have to be able to politically educate each other. You know, if we, if we can struggle over how we understand how this world works, you know, how we understand um, <clears throat> why there's police brutality and why there's abuse in the plant by the foreman, you know, they both come from the same root cause really you know but if we understand that root cause then we that also deepens our relationships and deepens our ability to work further together and be able to eventually get to the point where we can have a joint strategy you know our tactics might be different but both our tactics is leading toward the same strategy so i mean it's, it's those things that i think you have to do if you're going to develop deep, long-standing relationships that can also help us defeat this common enemy of capitalism. Can I add to that? Please. Thank you. So one of the things I want to mention is that in terms of building deeper connections, um, it's something that everyone can do, uh, is active listening. I think that is such a soft skill that everyone has and everyone can do and has ability, not everyone, but can do if you, if you want to do it basically. And so when I say active listening, I mean by being able to listen to what people need. And not just listening to, um, you know, when people when people say things what they when when people say things that they need, sometimes it can come across as someone's complaining, right? And really, it's a matter of being able to to take out that you know this person is complaining in quotes, right? And really being able to look at the feelings behind what this person is actually experiencing. So if someone is saying that, you know, I was listening to a podcast recently on women not having, and this is something, um, you know, that's a topic that's been long overdue, but just women not having access to simple pads and tampons uh, during incarceration, right? And so, what is that saying, right? Why, why, why don't they, when this is like, and a, like something that every, every woman needs, right? And so when you're, when you're listening to these different issues that these challenges and these barriers that people are facing, you know, being able to take out your own biases, take out your own stereotypes and active listen to what they're actually feeling and what their struggle is and how can you support and help them and provide resources to them, right? And the other thing is deepening the connections in addition to like the active listening is being able to like center the margins. And so when we're making decisions for women's rights and around, um, and I'm, spe I'm speaking specifically around things that I work in and around incarceration. We need to have people at the table 
who actually have been directly impacted to be able to voice what their needs are. You can't possibly make a decision on women's rights with all men at the table. And so that's what I mean by centering the margins. Have people who actually have lived those experiences at these tables making these decisions and listen to them. That is so important. Um, and so that's what I will say is like being able to deepen the connections is simply just listening to people and centering the margins and giving people opportunities and seats at those tables where decisions are being made about them that are going to be impacting them. And then, um, do you have anything else to add to that? Nope, you <laughs> they took it away. <laughs> um, so I have a question that's for Jerome specifically. Um, it says capitalist systems in Africa are run by Af Black Africans and the Black African leaders suppress their own people. White supremacy, as you all know it, does not exist in Africa, but they have oppressive systems as well. How do we account for the role of capitalism in places where white people are not the majority? Okay. Um, capitalism is an economic system. Anybody, anybody can organize their society along capitalist lines. The most, you know, when we were studying capital, you know, Marx wrote these three volumes of, of about the running of capital, how capital, capitalism actually works. And, and, you know, it actually has laws, you know, and one of the main laws of capitalism is the maximization of profit. That if you're a capitalist and you're not maximizing your profit, the other capitalists are gonna run you out of business. You're not gonna be around very long because that's a law, you know? And, and um, so it doesn't matter whether you're white or black, if you are in control of a system that says the most important thing is to maximize your profit, that means that every other thing is lesser value. You know, relationships between people, that don't matter whether or not people are being oppressed and exploited for other reasons, you know, like their religion or their tribal heritage, all those things which apply in, in Africa, you know, um, it doesn't matter if it interferes with them maximizing their profit. You know, so it doesn't matter what color you are, uh, you're gonna run a society based on exploitation and the maximization of profit. You're going to destroy people. You're going to destroy relationships. You're going to destroy a lot of stuff if you run your country like that, the same way that we're destroying things here in the United States because of the way this society is organized. The, the, other, the other thing about capitalism is that it is a class society, you know, and the people who own everything, they're in a, they're part, they're, part of what we call the ruling class. And people that don't have to work for a living, we're part of the working class. And in different countries, they have their own peculiar thing that plays into that relationship of class. Here in America, the most important thing that plays into that is white supremacy, is this whole notion of race. You know, we have a queer class society, but if you, for one moment, ignore race, and, and white supremacy, you're in serious trouble, particularly if you're trying to do any organizing. You know, in Africa, some of the, the peculiarities is tribal history. You know, you've got these uh, different historical developments of different tribes and they use that against each other or religion. You know, um, the Irish, the reason that the English so-called uh, oppress and exploit the Irish, who also is white, is because they're Catholic, you know, and, and, and so um, only thing my point is, is that capitalism is a universal thing. It can be used by anybody. And they can put, put their own particular histories in to even make the exploitation worse for a certain segment of the community, you know, and so 
So it's not, you know, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that if an African country is a capitalist country, it's going to be oppressive and exploited because that's what capitalism is at its core. Thank you. Um, going off of that, um, just as a question, um, if you all were to, because you all talked about a lot of learning and learning from each other and that type of thing, and reading and studying, what books would be recommended, <laughs> right? If you're going to recommend some books, like people like, you know, dabbling in this, like what books about um, topics should people be reading um, and going forth? Like, cause I know you talked about a lot, so what would you recommend? I mean, I probably know some, but cause of Waldo, you know, but like, just what are some books that we would recommend for us to like, us as academics, right? We, we like to read, we like to theorize all those type of things. So what should we be reading and looking at? And anyone can answer this question. Let the other two go first, particularly the last one who keeps saying she don't have anything to add. I want her to go first so that she can, you know, get her stuff out there too. And then I will add to it. Um, I think you're talking about me and my pronoun. I use they them pronouns, but I mean since I was passing out, um, or is it Naj? You wanna go? <laughs> I was passing out, I, like I said, I passed out 100 free Asada books on, on Saturday, on Sunday. So, I mean, that was a very, very uh, fundamental book in my uh, political development. And uh, Sada Shakur is an amazing storyteller and, you know, is still alive and is still struggling in Cuba and has been in exile. So I think it's always a good time to uplift her. Um, yeah, so that's what I'm going to offer. I mean... Yeah, come back to me. <laughs> I think that's a great that's a great book. I like just created a list for my friend of like Pan Africanist books. So like how how uh, Europe underdeveloped Africa. I'm like reading a lot of stuff around um, Black women and communism. So there's a book on called Pan Africanist Pan Africanism and communism. Um, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of books, but Asada Shakur is definitely I feel like a good starting place. So I'm actually like writing stuff down because there's a couple that I was thinking about. Um, so one is Sexual Citizen. Um, sexual Citizen is basically a research on sex and power and gender in today's society. So that's a great book. Um, the other one is Push Out, uh, which is talking about the criminalization of young black girls starting in early as elementary and middle school. Um, the other one is The Sun Does Shine, uh, which is about a man who was incarcerating facing life uh, for something that he did not commit. Um, the other book that I'm very proud to mention, I've, um, I am officially a published co-author, um, so I'm, I'm breaking generational, generational curses doing things that, you know, it's never been done in my family, so I'm very humbled about it. I'm a co-author. It's available on Amazon. The book is called Meditation Through Yoga or Resilience Through Meditation and Yoga. And it's on Amazon. And I'm co-author in volume five. Uh, and I share about how meditation has been, and it looks different because meditation doesn't have to look like your pretzel style, you know, listening to a uh, med guided meditation, it can look different for everyone. And so I talk about the different meditation styles that I used that really helped me heal um, through the loss of my father. And so I share my story about that in, in volume five. So it's on Amazon. So please check that out. And then I also have a book, uh, my official book coming out in spring. Um, and so I can share my website um, for that. That's coming soon. Uh, and that'll be released late spring this year. God willing, I'm so excited about it. Um, and my book is called Carry It With You. And
and I speak about the different life experiences that I've ex- endured and been able to uh, overcome with the message that you have to embrace the things that you experience and not be ashamed of it because it's made you the amazing person you are today. Um, And so being able to embrace your story, being able to embrace your narrative um, and not let someone else share your story for you. So that's what Carry It With You is about. And I can share those those links uh, for those two books. So thanks for uh, asking that question. It's really great to kind of like say that out loud. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, congratulations to you. Thank you so much. So I was thinking about two books. You know, one, um, I used to do a college tour back in the day. And one of, um, one Black History Month tour that I was doing, I was concentrating on reconstruction. And it was really shocking to me that not only did not many of the students have any idea what, what was really going on during Reconstruction, but most of the professors didn't either. So one of the books I would recommend, of course, is Black Reconstruction by Du Bois. Uh, everybody should read that book, not only because, <laughs> there you go, not only because it's a great book, but it relates to my second book that I want to recommend is that the South, the Southern part of the United States is, is a really critical part of this country and and the history of it is so critical because it's still playing out. It's playing out in each and every one of our lives every day, you know, you, and, and uh, so we need to know as much about that history of the South as we possibly can. So Black Reconstruction helps us with that. And the other book is by uh, Robin Kelly called Hammer and Ho, which is really about the history of, of, uh, sharecroppers and communists in Alabama and how that whole struggle of sharecroppers developed in the 30s and 40s. And and so both of them lead us to a a better understanding of the South, but they also uh, both indicate why it's so important to, to have a theoretical context in which you're understanding this world in. So Hammer and Hole by Robin Kelly, and Black Reconstruction by Du Bois. Thank you. Those are, you saw I had my Black Reconstruction, I had my student read some of it, so it's like it was right next to me. Um, and so, you know, we're almost at time. So the last question that um, each of the panelists wanna ask um, is like any kind of, you have the audience of a whole bunch of academics, right? Like a whole bunch of people on college campuses, um, people that are doing research, people that are professors, um, teachers, what have you. Um, and in this kind of elite, you know, class, quote unquote. Um, so what would you say to us, right? And so in this movement, there's a lot of movements we've talked about or things that we're all involved in, but what will be, what would you want your message that we get from you to be, right? And like, you know, this either, this is what, you know, we need as a community, you should, you know, like, what do you want to get across to this population about the work that you do, the work that we need to do together and how to move forward? Um, and so we can just keep going in the order that we've done all, all evening. So Jerome, you want to go? Yeah, I will be very short with this one. Um... The first thing I would say is, y'all academics today have a responsibility to ensure that the academy is open for the next generation. You know know how much it costs for y'all to go to college right now? Y'all got to do something about the cost of tuition and, and how they eliminate most of us, most black folks from ever even getting into college because we can't afford to go. Now y'all, y'all are in the middle of it and you can do something about that. You can be the spearhead of this fight to lower tuition costs, to actually eliminate tuition costs in this day and age. You know, you know, and so let's get that fight on. And 
you won't be by yourself. There's many people out there that understand that one of the major fights that we're enduring right now is our ability to have access to higher learning. You know, and under, under the society that I'm fighting for, all that will be free and open and universal. You know, and that's one of the aspects that I think we ought to be fighting for. But in the meantime, fight to keep those colleges and universities accessible to poor and low-income people, particularly people of color. Can you repeat the question? Um, I would. I was just saying, what do you want us as people on this pan or on the uh, call um, as academics? What do you what do you want to say to us? Like, or a charge, or what do you need from us? What should we be doing? Like, any parting words of like us as an audience, which you would want us to know? Okay. Like a call to action. Yeah. Well, if you're in D.C., there's a route. There's a rally on Monday. It's a Haiti Solidarity Rally. There's an international day and just a little more context um uh you know haiti was the first uh free black nation that defeated french uh colonialism and so haiti has been, been being punished for the last over 200 years for exercising the right and the, the fight for self-determination and so in its re recent iteration of struggle um there has been, you know, U.S. interference as usual in the elections, um, U.S. sending billions and millions of dollars, the U.S., Canada, Europe sending millions of dollars to Haitian police and Colombia police to repress protests. But there are millions and millions of people hitting the streets every day demanding that U.S. get out of Haiti, U.S. get out of Haitian affairs. Um, and uh, on February 7th, uh, there was there's a U.S. backed uh, uh, dictator, uh, Moise, who um, was supposed to leave office um, and has been backed by the U.S. Was supposed to leave office on the February 7th, but refuses to leave, leave office. While since that time, the U.S. continues to send money to the Haitian government and the Haitian police and military to repress protests. And so there's a call and action on the ground to show solidarity. And, you know, something that I always uplift is like Haitian said, uh, wherever Black people are, if they come to Haiti, they can be free. And so there's that sense of, of solidarity and history and connection. So if you are in DC or any other city, there, there's, there's, there's rallies happening all over the cities. Um, and, you know, I'm in, like I said, I'm a lawyer, so I'm, I'm kind of in the, the same spaces <laughs> in and out with, with multiple legs in different spaces. So I, I just agree with Jerome around like, you know, they're not just canceling student debt, but also just making education free and also shifting and changing these institutions while also building institutions out. So what are the skill, what are the topics and things that you're learning that you can then build relationships with communities in order to develop more knowledge outside of the academic academia, but still using those resources. So that's, that's my offering. So I would say uh, begin to normalize conversations around domestic violence and not just domestic violence, but the root causes of domestic violence, like Jerome was mentioning, the patriarchy, right? And beginning to understand the history of why domestic violence is such a silent epidemic and understanding that it's a matter of power and control. And beginning to normalize these conversations in institutions on college campuses, um, begin to actually develop and bring programs into correctional facilities because there are no programs in correctional facilities around domestic violence prevention. The programs that these women receive is a video that was recorded in like the 18th century and a packet to fill out. That's their education around domestic violence prevention. When you have over 80% of the women who are incarcerated who have been human trafficking victims or who have been domestic violence or sexual assault survivors, that's not education. And so begin to make spaces and have funding to be able to provide these programs um, for women who are incarcerated as well as 
um, on college campuses, right? There's so often I hear, you know, it was such a struggle and I will say it was such a struggle to be able to get funding for my program on a college campus. The process that they make students go through is absolutely absurd. It takes months to be able to be a student organization. It should not be that. It shouldn't take months and you shouldn't have to go through all of these different red tapes and these challenges and these barriers. It should be a very streamlined process for students to be able to develop an organization. And I think being able to provide access and resources for students to be able to do that and to be able to be funded by their university or by their college um, is so important when they want to develop these organizations. So I will say is normalizing these conversations um, and being able to normalize the conversation so that it can lead to these different spaces where people can share and connect and collaborate, um, as well as from that grow to what are the resources needed um, for, for these women, for these young women, and for these men. I will say that as well, um, just because you know domestic violence does not discriminate against sex, race, religion, social economic status, um, gender or anything like that. So I think that is so important. And then the other thing I will say as like a call to action, um, you know, if you know someone even like myself who is doing this work, reach out, you know, reach out to folks like myself who can be able to provide this information to your college campus or be able to provide this information to your staff and to your to your network. So reaching out to folks like myself who are doing this work on the ground and who have this actual lived experience is so important, um, as well as the education and professional background. But I believe anyone who has the lived experience is an expert in what they do. Um, and so, you know, being able to connect with folks like that and, and being able to provide those resources where you're at and meeting people where they are. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of our participants and your thoughtful questions and a special thank you to all of the pan panelists tonight. Your words were incredibly powerful and insightful and I think that we took away a lot and all learned a lot tonight. So thank you so much for everything. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Of course. Thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you all.